Um, thank you very much, Ian, for the introduction. Uh, now everybody knows about my three masters. <laughs> I really appreciate that uh, intro. Um, before I get started, I just want to say thank you to the organizing committee and Ian uh, for um, for the session and inviting me. Also for all the great um, you know sessions that we've had yesterday and today. Uh, so what I'm going to do in the next 25 minutes is to touch on um, computer vision um, and some of the work that I've been uh, conducting in the area of bringing that into construction, mostly construction management as opposed to construction engineering. I titled the talk in uh, balancing rigor and relevance. Um, those of you who know me, you know that I've you know spent uh, the past 15 years of my life in this area. And I've worked on many different applications, scan versus BIM, scan to BIM, automated detection and tracking of resources on the job site, activity analysis. But really what I wanna to do today is speak about my journey and some of the lessons that I've learned at the interface of what I've been doing over the past 10 years of my life, which is bringing some of these AI driven solutions to the market and some of the things that I've learned from that. But before I get into any of that, I wanna to touch on some of the um, more fundamental academic oriented work that I've led and some of the contributions that I've had with some of my colleagues into computer vision as a core domain. And I wanna speak about the importance of that, things that I've learned from Ian, Raphael Sachs and many others on, on interfacing the two domains. And um, late, uh, toward the end of my uh, presentation today, I wanna to touch on some of the uh, um, open questions that we all have to ask in the context of an institute for AI. And I'm gonna be touching on that soon. But before I get into those details, I want to start by uh, you know, touching on some of the uh, statistics of uh, the market. Um, I know we all see these numbers, but I want to pitch you a slightly different angle to it. You know, in the United States, um, construction has been booming. Um, in fact, the value put in place has exceeded $1.4 trillion. And even we had pandemic, the growth in many of our sectors were actually positive given the you know, many backlog of projects that we've had. Growth was actually 0.4% positive last year. But when you look into these numbers and we all know how much of that money really goes into our resources and some of the waste that is associated to it, you know, we have an opportunity for impacting this productivity. Like I said, you know, we've all seen these numbers, but that number resonates really well with me. $200 billion of potential value that can be added if we add this productivity gap. Just to put that into the context, uh, we saw many great projects that Jennifer, um, Reinhardt and many other people touched on prior to my presentation, but this is 50 times the largest stadium that we're building in the United States, Inglewood Stadium in California. Uh, but what does this number mean, especially in context of uh, the pandemic and some of the challenges that we've also seen facing us on the productivity side? So I've had the opportunity of interfacing with Dutch, uh, Steve Jones team, McKinsey and quite a few others to gather data on what does this impact really mean for those of us who are engaged in bringing solutions to project controls life cycle. And um, as you know, um, as, it, as, as you can all imagine, the impact has been uh, quite severe. More than 50% of typical commercial projects that we all interface with end up being finished behind the schedule and over budget. And when we have mega projects, that number is actually close to about 98% when it comes to cost and you know, time. Now, among all different factors, you can start you know, quizzing various stakeholders to see what are the metrics that matter to them the most. In fact, interesting enough, Steve Jones uh, took a very interesting approach to this and asked owners, clients of projects, what are the most important factors that you care about uh, when it comes to construction? This question was asked to you in the construction phase. And you know, the response is quite surprising. Project design, the lowest. And yes, we all know if you spend more money on front-end engineering design, there's a huge value of minimizing rework, some of the problems that even Virtue Akinchi touched on yesterday as it relates to quality. But again, the question was asked during the construction phase. We trust our contractors to be responsible for safety. Quality is our specification. Budget, we have contracts for that. But if there's one variable that is most difficult to manage in terms of uh, making sure that the project is um, um, meeting those expectations, is really that the schedule. And uh, my interest has been really focusing on that over the past uh, 15 years of my life. And you know, for us to really understand the basis of why we have to be looking to some of these AI-driven solutions, I really want to take you back to some of the fundamentals. Every project that we have always starts with a plan, whether you're implementing last planner system, pool planning processes, or conventional earned value-based methods. Then we go and execute according to the plan. And our hope is we can get together in a timely fashion, typically weekly, to really understand what is the basis of the improvement and use that to uh, update the project. There are four specific problems that matter here. One, 
you know, and from an academic perspective, uh, we've been able to um, bring a lot of these concepts of last planner system, but as Raphael Sachs and quite a few other folks that we have actually on the call today and we heard from them have uh, shown many of these practices would require a closer examination to some of the foundational aspects that we have in how we are implementing these techniques. And the absence of having these champions that we always have in these processes, it's very normal for our teams to go back into conventional practices where we are only reflecting on the past as opposed to being, being proactive about the future or you know, using the concept of location-driven uh, project management. The second issue has to do with the fact that, you know, many of our companies have really become um, good at putting together milestones and long-term plans. But when it comes to understanding how we can execute tasks every day, every week, there's a whole lot of room for improvement. I've been capturing data for many projects that I've had uh, interface with, and our analysis shows that there are many reasons that short-term plans, our weekly work plans, long, um, and, and look at the schedules, are not uh, achieving the goals that we desire. Plans change, work areas are not available, underestimated effort, and so on and so forth. But if you closely look into them, almost 80% of them are preventable. The problem we have is that the status of the work is not being communicated back to the individuals who are involved in the process. And story of my own life, when I used to work in construction sites, even in 2021, when I visit uh, in the context of some of the startup companies that I'm engaged with, we always see pictures like this, where we um, you know, rely on our field engineers walking around and documenting progress. We've gone past from those uh, days of paper, now we're using digital solutions, some that are actually brought by Nemechek uh, and Bluebeam and uh, Don Jacobs as an example. But then um, you know, we rely on people get together on a weekly basis and communicating all that information back to us. And the last problem has to do with the fact that our planners, the people who create these plans are removed from the site. So they're oftentimes missing that feedback loop of what is really happening on the site so we can use that as a basis of performance improvement. So I was really fascinated by looking into how we can solve these problems of planning, monitoring, and control, specifically closing the loop on how the basis of the plan can be updated. And you know, my approach to it from an academic perspective was really to tap into emerging and existing data. I wasn't really thinking about AI to begin with. I was really thinking about what form of data would be most meaningful. And we've already heard a lot about BIM. We all know what is the value that BIM adds. I was really hoping that I can tap into that in the context of project um, execution. If we can tie that into that production level schedule, we can have a meaningful model that will show us how much work is expected to be done. And there's a ton of work done on that front on the 40 BIM. On the other aspect of it, I was really fascinated by visual data. And there's been a significant growth in that. Um, my fascination is really simplicity of this data. The fact that you show that to a foreman on the site, to a superintendent, to a project executive, everybody really understands what's happening. But there are many form factors of that data. And over the last three years, 360 cameras, um, drones have really dominated that market. So in the context of using visual data as a feedback to that 40 beam, this is really what I envisioned a long time ago, a, an interface where you'll be able to always see what is there on site, versus what should be there. And if you can color code that and make that entire experience measurable for people who are engaged in our project, we have a basis of improving that. So over the years of actually working on this sort of data-driven approach to project controls, and not every type of data, visual data. And the thinking has been the following. If we can create 4D BIM, you know, we've all um, shown in many different cases the value that it can bring in. We can help create more reliable plans. If we can generate reality data, we can go ahead and use that as a feedback to the plan. And the combination of the two, for the you know, sake of brevity, I'm gonna call it digital twins, um, a replica of that BIM that comes from the reality as a basis of addressing some of those coordination and communication issues. And if I can find the Delta, now I might have an opportunity to apply predictive data analytics, analyze the schedule and forecast the future. Now mapping that into an academic work, it means we have to ask uh, ourselves uh, whether we have um, some of the foundational capabilities for doing that. One is how can I align a simple 2D image against a BIM or a 4D BIM that may or may not show the same type of elements that I have on the site. The second question is, is there a way for me to detect and characterize changes that I see in the scene? And if I can detect them and understand what's going on, can I go ahead and relate that back to the plan? Plan whether being that BIM or plan from a scheduling perspective, the baseline that we have as a base of the work. So um, I started working on figuring out the way that I can you know, make this alignment happen. And 
in my earlier works, um, you know, it was more straightforward because we had time lapse cameras, a fixed view, and with perspective endpoint algorithms, you can, you know, easily address this. But when you think about complexity of these models, the fact that design is an abstraction of the reality, and the fact that you know things that we model are not reflected in the reality of the scene, you would immediately understand that we need to come up with other strategies associated with um, this type of alignment, and we can't afford doing that manually anymore. Um, for those of you who know more about computer vision, this is an 11 degree of freedom problem that we have to solve. So instead of doing that, I actually started learning more about computer vision, which Ian touched on my third master's, which was, you know, how do I, how do I stitch these images together so I can generate the reality model uh, of the site? And if I can do that, then I can go ahead and use that as an interface to bring uh, design into alignment. Fast forward uh, five years ago, when this platform was launched commercially, that is now used in four different continents, um, it, this is that experience. Every time you're capturing on the job site, you can log into a system and you can kind of see what's going on on the site. Uh, here, in this case, you see a $150 million project in St. Louis. You can kind of see a steel structure uh, with concrete. Uh, you can see where the cameras are being captured from. And uh, that will be that experience that you can bring to the job site from pictures. So people can go ahead and click on any location that they desire, and they can immediately see what's happening there uh, with having measurement capability. Now, if you have that type of model, we can go ahead and map that against the um, plan. I already mentioned about some of the challenges. You know, we don't need to solve everything through automated techniques. We can rely on our civil engineering knowledge and say, you know, let's have a few control points that can help guide how the design is going to be sitting in, um, uh, in that actual scene. And you may argue whether you want to be automating this or not. And there are many different ways of uh, thinking about it. But basically, if you can achieve that, that means your plan has mapped against that reality on the site, reality map, as opposed to pure capture. And in that context, that means every day on the calendar, when you have a superintendent on a job site, they can log into a system and they can see who does what work in which location. They can go in and communicate that to folks that are on the site, extract the quantity, obviously, from the model and also from the reality in contrast to two. And of course, then you can get into the same color coding I was showing you before, which is how would I, you know, automatically find these changes? In, you know, my earlier days, I was really trying to see if I can um, automatically address this. And the way I was thinking about it is primarily based on geometry, which is I have an understanding of what needs to be done on the job site from BIM. Can I go ahead and use that to reason about visibility of the scene and find that delta to some form of a um, computer vision feature detection wrapped around the machine learning uh, framework? I'm not going to go into the get into the details, but early works were really focused on physical changes. Um, and the idea was, you know, to reason about that visibility based on all images that we had. And instead of, you know, doing uh, rule based um, inference here, we wanted to see if we can learn that hyperplane that can automatically find changes in the scene. And yes, the numbers look great. Uh, we had opportunities of publishing this in computer vision venues. Um, so it was publishable. But let me show you some of the challenges that we had back then that really brings us back to some of the foundational issues that we have that still needs to be addressed before we can solve those practical problems that I started my presentation with. Um, detecting physical evidence. Uh, algorithms like this are going to fail and not being able to differentiate between form work and concrete. And when we don't have visibility, there's no way we can reason about it. So I went back to the drawing board and many years ago, I had the opportunity of learning some of these techniques from Yanis Brilakis. And this was at the time that, you know, some more modern algorithms had come out. So the idea was, all right, let's see if we can detect different construction materials from pictures. And uh, that means first, I need to know what are the types of materials I'm expecting. Guess what? Formal representation of these construction sequences are not really available. We had works that goes back into Diego Echeverri and Bill Ips that they performed back in Illinois in 94, 95. But many of those techniques haven't really made it to any of our rule-based systems at all. Uh, we have to worry about granularity of the BIM model, schedules that we're dealing with in all disciplines. And this becomes a, a more foundational problem. But again, as a proof of concept, you can say, well, now you have a scene where BIM and images are aligned. So maybe you can go ahead and back project take images, um, extract patches of images from your observations and use that as a base of inference. And yes, we put that into the testing. Uh, over about three years of capturing data on several projects, we were able to demonstrate that, yes, we can slightly improve our capability of progress detection um, and, and, and see if we can uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, prove that concept, that it is possible to tap into that simple data and automate the progress. But none of it really means anything to, to the practice yet. 
then we tapped into some of the knowledge of uh, you know, uh, relationships and constraints that we have in the design model and formal knowledge of uh, construction sequencing. Um, Andre Borman has done some really great work in this area and Raphael Sachs has also touched on it even in his presentation, slightly different application, but the same concept where, you know, by tapping into this uh, um, semantic information that we have in the BIM and the importance of that that Raphael mentioned in his presentation, there's an opportunity to improve these techniques. But let me show you what we learned from it over bringing that into the practice. So over the past, uh, you know, 10 years of my life, I've continuously tried to bring this into all kinds of applications. And there's been a lot of learning for that. In one example, starting with that 3D reconstruction process, before we commercialize this solution, we implemented this over 126 different data sets. Um, these are projects uh, from all over the world. Examples that I'm showing you are dominant in the US, where we had collaboration with, with the Japanese Taisei Corporation. Um, and so we had to come up with all kinds of new techniques of how we can even visualize that data in a web-based system uh, so people can you know, start getting access to that. And then we learned computation time is extremely important. So as a base of that, we figured we need to sit down and engineer that entire pipeline of algorithms that we're using. And you know, we were able to um, have some contribution to uh, the world of computing as opposed to foundational computer vision on how these algorithms can be optimized and they can achieve uh, progress um, uh, modeling of the scene faster. Then we learned that um, when you apply this at a scale, at a scale, and I really mean thousands of data sets, there are some really foundational problems that would surface uh, that deserves attention. One is there's no guarantee on completeness of the scene um, if you haven't really planned for the capture, which is almost all the time. There's no guarantee that these types of optimization would not get stuck in local minima, or there's no guarantee that we can actually have the scene up to scale so we can probably use that for measurement. So we spawn this off as a model assisted structure for motion, which is bringing that knowledge of civil engineering that we understand the geometry of the scene, maybe that can guide us on how we can solve this optimization problem. And of course, the idea was very simple. Instead of using BIM at the end of the process, wouldn't we bring that upfront so we can go ahead and use that to guide the process of alignment? Then we can map this as a simple perspective endpoint algorithm. We can anchor these cameras. And if you can do that, we can solve a model constraint structure for motion, a pipeline that we have. For those of you who don't know the details, I'll show you a visual of what it means. That means when you offer a lot of images of a job site in a BIM, you ask someone to assist aligning one single picture against BIM, you would go ahead and use that based off of that perspective endpoint process, aligning all the rest of the images that we have. And we would run that through that model constraint optimization. So we can actually achieve something is slightly better than structure for motion. And of course, if you want to publish this back into the core community, you have to make the case with their data sets too. So for the first time we released this construction data set, we also benchmarked this on Middlebury data set that actually does have quite a lot of CAD models that were the basis of that uh, image-based reconstruction in the first place. And we're able to demonstrate that yes, bringing civil engineering knowledge back into computer vision does improve things, particularly for 3D reconstruction in the built environment. Uh, more examples of that, it actually solves some of those drift problems that we've had before. Again, benchmarking that's against some of the other techniques and it can help us achieve more complete uh, representations of the scene. The second, uh, the third aspect of it was, now that we understand geometry helps, can we also use that as a base of material um, recognition? And this is a very growing area in our community. I don't wanna to touch on it too much, but I just wanna show an example that bringing some of these concepts back into that community excites that core AI community to work on new ways of thinking about the problem. This idea was very simple. We understand the geometry we've seen before we take pictures. So if we can leverage that, can we improve the basis of that deep learning recognition that we have? And yes, we're able to demonstrate that it does. And um, I'm really excited that these types of uh, things can happen, but it can only happen when you start applying these techniques at a scale. The other one was when you bring it into the practice, you really wanna understand how you can um, you know, proactively address those issues as opposed to color coding of the past. It is fine if you wanna color code you know, red and green, but it can only help you with payment application as opposed to proactively making changes in your plan. So here we've been tapping into a hybrid uh, machine learning sort of models where um, other regression techniques that we've always traditionally used for um, productivity forecasting are being um, leveraged in a hybrid model with deep learning frameworks for fast computation. So we can forecast the future as a, pass, as a basis of past observations. And 
we will spend more than two years observing the impacts of making these changes to the practice. And this is an example of that. This is a project in Chicago. You can actually see a superintendent running the meeting by brainstorming and bringing the entire team to be more proactive. Those locations that are marked on the screen are showing you the future as opposed to the past. So now the entire conversation changes. We have something that is the basis of, you know, uh, locations as opposed to trades, and we can have more proactive conversation on how uh, we can address these problems. I don't want to get into the numbers, but if you have interest, there's a publication that just came out that shows how this has actually improved the basis of uh, coordination and updating the baseline schedules. So in this part of my presentation, I just want to touch on a few technical contributions. When we have an opportunity to apply some of these techniques at a scale, uh, it does take a lot of time, but it does bring some of the really interesting observations back to the core domain. Now we can go back to the drawing board, optimize the 3D reconstruction processes, how we can do better recognition and even uh, inference. But you know, one, one thing that I've learned over the past few years is there's a lot of challenges that we also need to worry about when we start thinking about scaling this. So I'm calling that crossing the chasm, um, like a you know, sales pitch rather, uh, which is when you start bringing these techniques into uh, AI driven um, products and you apply them to the mainstream construction, your whole world really changes on how you have to solve these problems. And all of us, with no exception, we're at that interface of AI and the application. So it's important to figure out how you can introduce these techniques one at a time so the teams do not feel that they're being overwhelmed uh, with um, you know, some of these sophistications. Where are you going to get all that data you would need for AI-driven product as opposed to simple product? People keep asking, does it fit my workflow as opposed to changing that workflow? And we all know that resistance that we got when Bing was being adopted and adapted. The same applies here. And lastly, our whole world of assessment of these techniques completely changes. Um, instead of looking to AI-driven metrics of precision recall, we have to go back to some of those foundational aspects of construction. Can we measure um, you know, impact on the bottom line, time and cost? And for those of you who have interest on that front, there's uh, quite a few um, examples that we've done um, um, in terms of how that transparency helps with uh, less travel time, uh, minimizing rework, on, on scheduled delivery. So if you had interest on that, all these cases studies have been published over the past few years. What I want to quickly touch on is when you get in involved in uh, these types of AI products, does that help us create new opportunities for research? And I thought I should pose this question in the context of this Institute for AI, because it actually does. Many of us have been working on this concept of bringing BIM and uh, image-based point clouds for automated progress detection. But the reality has shown us that many projects at mainstream, they don't have models at the right granularity, or they don't have schedules that are even meaningful for tracking progress. So if you want to start educating the industry and taking them into this journey toward or more mature um, uh, workflows, then you got to go back to the basic drawing boards and look into how you can contribute back into 2D and very simple 3D models. So there's a ton of stuff that is coming out here that can better relate to workflows by automatically detecting changes without any BIM, without any schedule. So you can improve the basis of that. The other aspect that I thought I should touch on is the fact that when you start thinking about these as a system, as opposed to an algorithm or model, which we had a lot of those presentations over the past few days, then you can start posing this question, which is, is it better for me to improve the data or is it better for me to improve the uh, model? There are many conversations that are happening around this in the world of machine learning. I just want to give you an example. If you focus on defect detection of the steel and you have a basis model, you may work with a company that says, you know, our target of accuracy would be 90%. If you start modifying your algorithms, oftentimes in you know, improvement you're going to get in that basic model will be very negligible. But if you take a data centric approach to it, that whole interface and how you're thinking about the problem have uh, changes. So the message that I really wanted to uh, communicate here is one of the experiences that we've had is data is um, equally or even more important than the model and the algorithm. And that's where our community can actually make a huge impact. Consistency of the data is paramount construction technology products can actually help with improving that data quality. So if you wanna be thinking about coming up with new methods, we need to think about them in context of a product workflow and how the industry can use that. So we can use that feedback to keep training models, improving the basis of the data. And of course, we heard a lot about data augmentation, labeling and refinement techniques uh, on those fronts. 
Um, Raphael and um, I think uh, um, uh, Marcus also touched on um, uh, synthetic data. Of course, there's a huge opportunity there. We've been looking to that, but again, there's a lot of argument on how that interfaces with the real data. So now that I've shown you some of the things that are also happening in that space, I really wanna you know, pose um, a few questions as we move forward. Where did we go here? Now we see a lot of AI uh, driven products that are coming to the market and we are all very deeply engaged in our own AI work. Just a few data points for you. There's been a tremendous investment in startup companies. Um, now um, that's close to about a billion dollar. Is it important for us to get that real data? Are they are companies willing to share that with us or are they willing to share that with startup company? Everyone has limited resources. Would it make sense for me to touch on that low hanging fruit of working with that company versus an academic institute? Um, how do we help the industry being educated in this workflow of using these products um, that are all AI driven? And keep in mind, many of our AI experts are actually being uh, recruited by, um, by the industry. Um, and we are at really that interface that we wanna solve those really interesting scientific problems, but we're all in construction. So we all also have to care about the bottom line. Does it impact the bottom line of the project in terms of cost and the schedule? And many of you know this uh, you know, sort of uh, type diagram, but I really wanna present that picture for you that this is where we are. If you wanna have that interface and wanna make that impact, we got to be part of this uh, conversation on streamlining this process. So I was really pleased to see uh, Nemechek um, has made this investment for the Institute of AI. Over the past year, year and a half almost, we've been also working on our own version of it on this side of the pond. Uh, it's a collaboration between Illinois, Carnegie Mellon, and we have about 70 companies. We love to um, uh, cross-examine our approaches uh, on how we're looking to foundational AI work and AI-driven products. And I think there's a huge opportunity if we can put the startups, tech companies, and academics together to streamline this uh, workflow of idea to products. So that's really all I have for you to share a little bit of my journey and some of the things that I've learned over the past few years of being involved in startups. Thank you.